the executive director for Rebuild Nigeria Initiative, and I will serve as your moderator this afternoon. Um, and we will begin the program with Mr. Stephen Eneda, the president for ICON, to give us the welcome address. Thank you, Adejimo uh, Keakutelo. Appreciate your consistency and in moderating several of our meetings. <clears throat> Yes, like uh, she has introduced me, I'm Stephen Anada. Uh, I work with uh, uh, different organizations uh, to bring about the issues confronting Nigeria and this are here. So today we are here to <clears throat> uh, deliberate on how can we maximize the opportunity and the network we have in the European Parliament and also in other European countries that uh, uh, are concerned about what is going on in Nigeria. Like, you know, Nigeria and the Sahel, Nigeria and the Sahel is, uh, is a terror triangle. That is what BBC, that's what BBC World News said last month, that Nigeria and the Sahel is a terror triangle. But the world most neglected and conflict reading region is Nigeria and the Sahel. And Norwegian Refugee Council uh, confirmed this in their publication as well. First three in this region uh, uh, are Boko Haram, uh, AIS West Africa, uh, Iswa Fulani militants, and many others. And when we talk about uh, Nigeria and the Sahel, we are talking about 11 contiguous countries like uh, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, the Gambia, Guinea, Mauritania, Mali, Nigeria, Niger, and Senegal. In this corridor, young girls have been trafficked across the Mediterranean as sex slaves. And also children have been recruited as child soldiers. Boko Haram is killing Fulani, Bandits or militants are killing every day in Nigeria. The implication of not doing something about these 11 countries that constitute the Sahel also spread doom for the European Union and all the nations in Europe. It's very, it's very unfortunate that uh, these fractured communities, countries, are the most neglected countries in the world. And it is incumbent upon every Nigerian based anywhere in the world to rise up to this occasion. And that is why this meeting is important. We have our friends. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazimo Introvayan and uh, Alexander, Alessandro Amekarelli, who actually I've met uh, a couple of times in DC during the ministerial and our friendship has continued to grow. And I'm, I'm a mentor, Bob Destro. And uh, I, I hope uh, our mother, uh, Baron Ecos, will join us and many eminent men and women who are present here today who are concerned about what is going on in Nigeria and the Sahel. So this meeting is going to uh, chart a new level of discussion, how we engage, and I'm looking forward to see what our guest panelists have for us. That said, I yield the platform. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ineda, for giving us the, the, the background to why we're here. So we have four guest speakers that would be speaking on this issue today. And after that, after each speaker um, gives their, their, their presentation, will follow with questions and answers. So the first speaker we have here is Dr. Alex Amicarelli, and he's the current chairman and spokesman of the European Federation for Freedom of Belief, FOB. He's a member and director of Obaseki & Co Limited. It's a law firm in England. Dr. Alex is a barrister that specializes in international and human, human rights law and immigration and refugee law. He has strong in interest for minorities and religious freedom for both new religious movement and traditional minority religious and spiritual groups. 
He has dedicated the last 20 years to issues related to the protection of freedom of religion and belief, the rights of refugee and displaced persons, and other human rights and immigration matters representing clients internationally. Dr. Amicarelli will be speaking on developing the appropriate campaign for the engagement with the EU and its bodies on the crisis in Nigeria and the Sahel. Welcome, sir. Good morning to all of you in the US and good evening or afternoon for us in Europe and the East. Uh, thank you very much to Stephen for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. It's uh, amazing all the time to be uh, in contact with uh, Nigerians. I'm surrounded by Nigerians. My law firm is mainly uh, British Nigerians. So I'm a Nigerian by association myself. And because I'm Italian, and uh, like Massimo knows, we tend to talk quite a lot and we never stop. Uh, I wrote down a few notes about today's <laughs> presentation, otherwise we would be spending too much time together. I'm not going to read all of it, but I will go through it, uh, skittering through the um, my notes. Uh, we, we, I would like to connect to what uh, um, uh, Stephen started saying about the region of Sahel. Uh, we need to say that the crisis in the Sahel is not a new one. Uh, very little or no attention is honestly given to that region of, um, of Africa. Uh, what is reported in the media is often uh, biased. And when talking about uh, uh, the Sahel, Nigeria and Africa, generally speaking, there are so many um, stereotypes still today in 2022. Um, Despite all of this, there is a very worrying crisis in the Sahel region, which lasted for over 50 years now. Yes, 50 years. Because even though the crisis as we know it today only started, um, or probably we should say worsened around 10, 12 years ago, the actual causes of all the problems started in recent times back in 1968, when a big drought caused a mass famine which lasted till mid 1980s and killed directly or indirectly, according to some sources, some over 100,000 people in the old region. Sahel is a vast territory which lies, as, uh, as Stephen said, from Mauritania to Djibouti in the east and comprises the full or portions of some 10, 11 countries. There is not even agreement on the number of countries being part of the uh, Sahel region, though five of them are considered to be the five main countries of Sahel, namely Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. But of course, Nigeria has uh, acquired uh, an important role, let's say so, in the region over the last decade. Uh, we must also recall that for centuries, that area of Africa was home to very influential and important civilizations and was a place of interest for scholars and researchers coming from all over the world. If we have to identify the main causes of concern in those areas, we could look at climate change and environmental issues, such as desertification, irregular rainfalls, uh, of course, poverty, food scarcity, and the consequence of um, malnutrition, uh, weak structures, uh, instability of the territories, uh, to some extent also uh, demographic growth and uh, overpopulation uh, and of course the main reasons why we are here today talking about the Sahel conflicts and extremisms of different natures. Uh, of course there are also issues of ignorance of the masses to a very high extent and in some cases unfortunately like everywhere corruption of the leaders. The situation is constantly deteriorating and the vulnerability of the population cannot be overlooked anymore. We know the problems in those areas have lasted for decades, mainly for geographical, but also political reasons. Um, it's a fact though that uh, the present problem started back in 2011 when the so-called uh, Jameria, as uh, Libya used to be called under Gaddafi rule, uh, several violent outbreaks were experienced in southern Algeria, Mauritania and Mali and Niger as well, causing an even more problematic deterioration of the situation in different areas of the Sahel. 
things got worse in 2012 with the Malian crisis, where groups of separatists took over the northern part of Mali, which prompted the military intervention of France and the UN Security Council informed the world that Al Qaeda had established their presence also in Senegal. Following these events, the situation deteriorated in the old region, causing the displacement as of 2019 of approximately 6 million people and lack of food for some 24 million people, as the UN reported. Needless to say, 2020 COVID-19 had its role in worsening the situation in the Sahel, not only affecting the local populations, but also causing delays in the uh, humanitarian aid efforts. The United Nations, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, in some programs also working together with Italy, the Netherlands and other countries, and of course the European Union, all had plans for the region of Sahel. As far as the EU is concerned, we need to say that as early as in March 2011, the European Union Council adopted a European strategy for security and development in the Sahel aimed at finding the right synergy between the promotion of development and the improvement of security in that region with intervention within the areas of development, good governance, internal conflict resolution, politics and, di and diplomacy, security and the rule of law, fight against extremist violence and radicalization. Even though the strategy of the last 10 years didn't meet all of its expectations, several actions were carried out and financial help was distributed in different countries. Since the previous strategy, which ended in 2021, mainly focused on security, didn't lead to significant results if we only consider the fact that terrorist organizations have proliferated and even expanded to other territories, in 2021, the EU launched a new strategy for the Sahel called the EU Integrated Strategy in the Sahel, which focuses mainly on promoting better governance and improving the humanitarian development and peace building efforts. The new EU strategy is shaped around what the United Kingdom has been doing for the last 10 plus years. In fact, the UK has taken a rather proactive approach in its role in the Sahel region. It has maintained a diplomatic work formula, which is created within international affairs policies. For instance, it has revised its trade relations with countries in the sub-Saharan Africa and revised its visa policy. The cost of remitting money to African countries has also been altered in order to facilitate easy transactions from the people living in the UK to the sub-Saharan countries. Working with the diaspora is key is very important. NGOs and other civil society groups and lobbying groups can um, exercise pressure on the governments and on people's representatives for doing more for implementing the EU strategy for the Sahel and to contribute to its success. Many groups of people from Mali, Nigeria and other countries of the diaspora based in the Western countries can certainly help the countries of origin with a number of actions. Awareness raising actions can be organized widely and at all levels. Campaigns are also a power instrument, powerful instrument to expose and sensitize the populations and make the situation of the Sahel known and help with implementation of the EU strategy and other strategies as well. Campaigns, of course, need to follow specific rules as identifying the objectives and goals, the target audience and key messages. Organizing a campaign, we organize a lot of campaigns with Freedom of Belief, with Cessna and other friend organizations, require a lot of organization along with creativity, of course, and knowing the background on which we are working. Planning, testing, reviewing and back again, planning, testing and reviewing are also important elements of any campaign. Big corporations can contribute to the success of the strategy in the Sahel, making investments in those areas, provide work opportunities, and so contribute to the solution of scarcity and anger of the local population, and also help face the climate change issues. 
not forgetting that these, there are several grants and chances of funding from the European Union that corporations and big groups of companies can access to without usually of specialized firms and organizations. Again, organization and competence of, are of paramount importance. Stakeholders can utilize the instruments allowed by the European Union lobbying regulations addressing the EU bodies and their representatives, and do so with the help of established organizations specializing in lobbying activities. There are so many opportunities of lobbying in the European Union institutions. And of course, last but not least, uh, everyone can get involved and can contribute if they are able to do so and support scholarly work. Things can improve and eventually change if everyone do our bit. Let me conclude with uh, a very short uh, two strophes from uh, uh, a poem of, of Nigerian poet Augustine uh, Oeg Bunam Ezeke. I choose freedom is the title. I'm a free moral agent. I detest imprisonment. I abhor bondage. I reject life in the cage. I'm imbued with the ability to choose. So I choose freedom. Freedom from political oppression, freedom from economic oppression, freedom from political and religious oppression. I was born to be free. And so no impediments should limit my freedom. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that great presentation. And the takeaway here is it is a global effort. What is happening in, in Nigeria and in the Sahel is going to take a global effort for us to tackle that. Thank you so very much. Next, we would have Mr. Bob Destro speak on how the US audience can work with the EU audience on human rights violation in Nigeria and the, in the Sahel. It's the building blocks. So uh, Mr. Destro, Mr. Bob Destro is a professor of law at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law in Washington, DC. He has been a member of that institution since 1982, served as interim dean from 1999 to 2001, and as the director of the university's Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies from 2017 to 2019. President Donald Trump nominated him to serve as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. And as the Assistant Secretary, he led the State Department's worldwide policy and foreign assistance programs on human rights and democracy issues, such as free and fair election, internet freedom, and the growth for the surveillance state. On the domestics, in the domestic sphere, Professor Destro has been an advisor to churches, and religious organizations from a variety of religious traditions and is regularly involved in cases right, raising civil rights issues from free speech and free exercise to employment law and tax policies. Welcome, sir. Yielding the floor to you, Mr. Destro. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, thank you for the, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, the um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the foreign policy politics of the situation in Nigeria, uh, and and I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of uh, somebody who tried to uh, take on the bureaucracy at, at it, within our own State Department uh, with the direct support of then Secretary Pompeo, uh, and actually. Uh, lost the battle and uh, we haven't lost the war by any stretch of the imagination but we're uh we're up against some very big odds and uh so let me tell you a little bit about a meeting uh that i had with uh with members of the eu foreign policy community in abuja uh, when i went to nigeria in uh, in october of 2020 and the uh the, the, the thing that was fascinating, we had the ambassadors of the EU, uh, the uh, Germans, the British, uh, the, and the Dutch. And obviously the, uh, the, we, we, we had dinner at the American embassy in Abuja. And so it was a, it was a very, uh, and, and also I believe uh, we had the Danes. And the, uh, the, it was pretty clear 
uh, that the other countries, uh, they were very interested, they were very engaged. Uh, they, know what the, uh, they know what the issues are. Um, they, uh, they understand the corruption issues. Um, and they were looking to the United States for some leadership. And, uh, and we were trying to provide that. Uh, but what we found is that, uh, once again, it's not an issue of do people, are people aware of the carnage? Are there people aware of the situation? Uh, they're painfully aware of it. You know, but the official narrative is it's climate change. It's, uh, it's, it's all the issues that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Micarelli just talked about. I mean that it is a we're we're well aware of what the situation is. The question is, what do you do about it? And the um, in the United States, the um, I think there's generally been a criticism of our own State Department uh, on several levels. Uh, the first one would be, you know, how many of these big issues do we miss? And when I say miss. I mean, we missed the Holocaust. We missed the Arab Spring. You know, we, you know, and you say, well, did they actually miss it or not? And the answer is they didn't really miss it. They couldn't get the bureaucracy to do anything. So if I were to go back into the, the records of the 1930s and see what happened with respect to the Holocaust, what we would find out is that they couldn't get enough people to agree to push it over the edge. And, and I know how difficult that is because I was uh, one of the people among many uh, who at the very, very end of the Trump administration pushed over, pushed the genocide declaration uh, over the edge in the State Department uh, with Secretary Pompeo. And, and I must tell you that the bureaucracy was near impossible. Now, when I would speak, for example, with, with representatives of the UK, the ambassador was on board, but she said, good luck with the foreign ministry. You know, and so when you look at the question of how do we then change the, how do we change the attitudes on the ground among our diplomats? And uh, the first problem is, uh, you know, again, a problem with, uh, with, American diplomats, uh, I think it's, it's less so with, with uh, some other countries, that they develop what's called clientitis. Basically, they begin to adopt the, the point of view of the locals because they have to deal with them every day. And they don't want to go in and deliver bad news. And, and so that was really the part of our goal was to provide some support for local groups so that they could then begin to advocate themselves at the at the embassy level because the embassy controls uh quite a bit of foreign assistance uh the uh it's it's really the people on the ground who are suffering who have to get in there you know but i know from outside experience from from uh from the times when I was not inside the State Department, uh, how useless those meetings can be. I mean, they take notes, and as a uh, as a uh, uh, a bishop in Iraq told me one time, he said, "I just had the impression that after I was done with the meeting, they took their notes, you know, balled them up, and played basketball with the waste can." You know, so the so what we have to understand is that there is a narrative out there, uh, and uh, and there's also uh, so you have this climate change narrative, and and I do know that our State Department is it consider it's pretty much right now abandoned Africa. I mean, it's a their interests are climate change and China. Uh, there and and so you know, in one respect. You know, we're not going to get any interference from them. You know, we're just not going to get any help from them either. And so the other piece is to look at, uh, and again, this is also true, especially with respect to the EU, is uh, we have to look at where the money is going. If you want to know where American foreign policy is on the ground, 
you need to look at who's getting the money. Uh, you know, which part, which NGOs are getting the money, you know, and, uh, and there's a lot of money uh, going from the United States, from the State Department, as well as from USAID uh, and other places. And, and we're eventually going to have to connect the people on the ground who can start asking questions about, well, how come they're getting the money when, when they don't do anything with it? You know, so this, so my orientation in all of this, as both Stephen and, and Kyle know, is I want to see change on the ground. You know, and to me, the metric is change on the ground. Uh, the other piece, and, and, I, and I will, uh, I'm going to have to run off to, to teach a class in a few minutes here. Uh, the other piece is this question of the Sahel uh, that uh, Dr. Amicarelli has talked about. And that is, uh, there is almost a, once again, a willful blindness. Uh, people do not want, it's not that they don't know, it's that they don't want to see uh, what's going on in the Sahel. The Sahel might as well be a paved superhighway for uh, Islamic radicals. I mean, they're basically coming in on the Horn of Africa and they're building hospitals, they're building schools. They're, I mean, it's a, there's lots of sources of this information that are completely impeccable. You know, I'm not going to mention who they are here because that would put them at risk. You know, but we need to map this out in a way that, uh, that people can see. You know, we need local people, you know, to go and take pictures, you know, and, and there's ways in which to protect them. We need pictures of the slave markets. You know, we need pictures of the kinds of things that, that, uh, uh, that, that some of our friends have been doing already. Uh, and, and as Stephen knows, we have to develop a, we have to develop audiences in our respective countries who will be receptive to this information and then get it to their respective legislators. And then lastly, uh, is the role of the business community, uh, because at, at the end of the day, that's who even corrupt listen, uh, even corrupt leaders listen to. And uh, and there are a number of initiatives in that regard that we're trying to start here uh, in the United States. Uh, it's going to be once again, uh, Africa has largely either been forgotten or or people think it's too hard to do business there. And uh, but if we can start getting the American business community hooked up with uh, the Nigerian, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, religious communities, uh, I think we can uh, uh, build a lot more uh, attention uh, to the issues. But uh, we've got the foreign ministries in many countries that are against us. It's not a it's an issue. It's reality. It's it's just it's a problem we have to solve. Uh, we have the business community is not as uh, as engaged as they need to be, and there's a willful blindness about Islamophobia. And so, especially at the EU and, and our, lo our, our level here, we have to resist this idea that that any looking at this issue is Islamophobia, and uh, and we're going to have to take that one on head on. But unfortunately, I can't do it, and and uh, Dr. Amicarelli can't do it. You, the Nigerians are going to have to do it uh, because otherwise, we're going to be accused of being racist. So, with that, I will uh, quit. And thank you so much for having me this morning. Thank you so much, sir, for that very open, transparent um, analysis of current issues. And uh, just following up with uh, what Alex has said, it is a global effort. So Nigerians will need the help of you and everyone else to do this because it is a global issue. So thank you for um, just being very open and transparent about those issues. I appreciate your time. Um, now we're going to move on to Dr. Maximo Introvain, and he's going to be speaking on the approach to obtain the EU attention and resolution on terrorism, girls enslavement and illegal arms in Nigeria and in the Sahel. Maximo is a law and philosophy graduate and has been that until 2016. He's a professor of sociology of religious and 
and political religious at Pontifical Salesman University in Torino, Italy. He is the managing director of the Center for Studies on New Religion, also in Torino. In 2011, he served at the, at, as the representative of Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He was in that institution, they were combating racism, xenophobia and intolerance to discrimination against Christians and members of other religion. And from 2012 to 2015, he served as the chairperson of the religious liberty created by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is an author of about 60 books on religious pluralism and new religious movement, including Satanism. Welcome, Dr. Introvain. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would like to discuss two points. Uh, uh, one point I will discuss as a sociologist, and another point I will discuss based on my experience uh, as the former representative for combating racism, xenophobia, and discrimination against Christian and members of other religions at the OSCE and uh, as chairperson of the uh, Observatory of uh, uh, Religious Freedom at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also as editor of Bitter Winter, a daily magazine covering uh, global religious liberty issues. Now, as a sociologist, uh, I would like to take the relay from uh, Professor Desto uh, because uh, uh, the, the problem here is uh, exactly how does this issue exactly relate to Islam? Uh, because uh, one problem is when we start discussing uh, uh, persecution of Christians in Nigeria, it's uh, exactly uh, the big obstacle is being accused of uh, uh, Islamophobia. And so how, what do we do to avoid this? And how we introduce the matter in uh, European Union fora, uh, avoiding uh, uh, the criticism uh, of uh, uh, Islamophobia. How can we combat uh, uh, racism and xenophobia, uh, as my title at the OSC said, and at the same time uh, combat persecution of, of Christians? And I believe we should establish some points which are easily provable uh, and uh, more or less agreed upon by scholars but not necessarily clear to politicians and to uh, media. The first point is that not all Muslims are fundamentalists. This is an important point. Islam is a huge reality. There are good manuals of sociology of Islam, and Islam is a very complicated thing, as is Christianity. These are the two major world religions in terms of number of followers, of devotees. So there is not one Islam. There are many Islams, and while fundamentalism is an important uh, tradition, at least uh, starting from the years around World War I in uh, modern uh, Islam, it's not the only tradition. So not all Muslims are fundamentalists. Second important point, not all fundamentalists are terrorists. Well, the definition of fundamentalism is unclear. In Italy, we have a national state encyclopedia, a little bit like Britannica, but it's managed by the government, not 
by a private uh, company. And I'm the author of the entry fundamentalism there, which is a long entry just because it has uh, an important part of how people do not agree on the definition of fundamentalism. But uh, uh, if uh, we consider within Islam uh, fundamentalist, not as what Max Weber would call an ideal type, but as an historical reality, which starts uh, with uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Egypt, uh, and then uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood becomes globalized, which starts with Maududi in, in the Indian uh, subcontinent and the Jamaat Islami and the all sort of developments there, and then gets it exported to Nigeria among other places. Uh, we can uh, see very well that uh, even fundamentalism is a complicated reality. We may not like fundamentalism as a, an approach, but we should acknowledge that in many countries there are uh, fundamentalist uh, political parties, for which I would probably not vote uh, if I was uh, a citizen of these countries, but uh, they try to uh, pursue uh, their idea of political Islam by participating in the elections uh, and trying to win them so uh, in a more or less uh, democratic way. So not all fundamentalists are terrorists. But then we need another two points. Uh, the first point is that terrorists are Muslims. Uh, there is a politically correct idea to say that terrorists uh, uh, just were not Muslim, they are false Muslims, uh, and they misused the name of Islam. But this is a theological judgment. It's not a, a sociological judgment. Uh, it will be like saying that Catholic uh, pedophile priests are not Catholic priests which, of course, if it's said by the Pope, it's a very valid theological statement, saying morally they are horrible people. They don't deserve the title of Catholic priests. But uh, I have written a couple of books about pedophile priests, and they sociologically, uh, clearly they are priests, they dress like priests, they function like priests until they are caught, of course. So sociologically, clearly they are priests. And uh, sociologically, uh, the groups who perpetrate, that perpetrate acts of terrorism in the name of Islam are part and parcel of the Muslim community. Very few people would say that they are not part of the social fabric of Islam. And also, these people, terrorists, are fundamentalists. Not all fundamentalists are terrorists, but some terrorists are fundamentalists. So if we want to study the ideological roots of terrorism perpetrated in the name of Islam, we should consider that the complicated history of fundamentalists that can also evolve in a non-violent way, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, part of the history of fundamentalism developed in a violent way. I believe if we establish these points, uh, not all Muslims are fundamentalists, not all Muslim fundamentalists are terrorists, but some terrorists are Muslim, and some terrorists are Muslim fundamentalists. We can create a template uh, avoiding uh, the issue of Islamophobia and recognize that within Islam there are wonderful persons and there are also terrorists. Just as, to quote my example, within the Catholic clergy there are very decent and even saintly and admirable persons, and then there are uh, criminal uh, pedophiles 
and even thieves uh, commit fraud. In all large religions, uh, there are this ambivalence. The religion may be uh, very high and spiritual, but religions are human things. They are not made of angels. They are made of human beings. Some of them are bad human being so that i believe it's an important point to avoid islamophobia but uh, recognize uh, that islam as other religions uh, as uh, uh, problems and islamic fundamentalism as problems now the second point very quickly it's a practical point in 2012 uh, when uh, i was uh, the chairperson of the Observatory of Religious Liberty in Rome, I organized a conference on Nigeria, which was uh, well attended and also well publicized. We had several Nigerian bishops, the 10 foreign minister of Italy, the previous foreign minister of Italy, the deputy minister, representatives of the United States and representatives of the Holy See and of uh, several other countries. So that had uh, some uh, media uh, impact and also led not the European Union, but at least the Italian parliament to develop uh, a program of health. Uh, now, uh, it worked well, but then it didn't continue. And I believe that's the practical problem I want to note. And it is that people unfortunately become accustomed to bad news. We see with COVID, we were all very anxious, how many died yesterday, but now it's a no normal uh, news. We want to, to read about other things. And it's the same about Nigeria, where the, the violence is so continuous that it becomes less newsworthy. So if you want to tackle the European Union to enter into the European Union programs, we need a concerted strategy. We need to multiply these events, and I want to thank Dr. Ananda for organizing this one. That's very important. But we need to do more. We need to have events in Brussels. Well, when events in person uh, becomes again uh, possible, hopefully, uh, we need to have campaigns, specialized media, including Brussels media, read by the people at uh, the European Parliament. And we need to keep the issue alive because, unfortunately, uh, even terrorism becomes routine and goes from the front page, uh, remember, bring the girls back, etc. But then uh, when it becomes routine, it goes in the internal page of the newspaper, pages that very few people read. So I believe uh, there are possibilities. I'm less uh, pessimistic than Robert Destro, even in a uh, complicated world political situation of bringing again the issue of Nigeria that is so important uh, to the front of the European Union effort for human rights, but we need a concerted, patient, continuous and resilient action to do this. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir, for the clarity again, even on um, understanding Islamic fundamentals and uh, extremists. Really appreciate all your efforts and the strategies you've worked on um, and how we will continue to keep this issue alive. Thank you for your time. So we the, we have the last speaker, who, Baronex Cox, I believe she's on here. Um, Baron X Cox will speak on how Nigerians can work successfully with the UK Parliament to bring pressure and policy policy actions on Nigeria. 
which is basically what we've been talking about so far. Bionics Cox is uh, FRCN, is a crossbench member of the British House of Lords. She's also the founder of an organization called Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. And Bionics Cox created, was created a life peer in 1982 and was a deputy speaker of the House of Lords from 1985 to 2005. In 2004, Baronex Cox founded Humanitarian Relief Trust, which is HART, leading countless missions to the world's most dangerous conflict zone to witness firsthand and document human rights violation and humanitarian support. She's supported by donors, individuals, churches, grants, and has published eyewitness reports to verify humanitarian needs. She's risked her life many times to bring aids to areas blockaded by author authoritarian government and has led over 50 visits to Sudan during the war raged, during the war raged by Islamic regime in Khartoum. And she continues to support the people of Sudan and the Blue Nile states. She's had many visits, visits to the war areas of Armenia enclave and more than 50 trips to Shan and Chin villages uh, in the Buma jungles and countless streets to assess Nigeria's Boko Haram and Islamist Fulani violence. Thank you, Baron X Cox. Over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I apologize for the delay in arriving. I had dreadful problems trying to establish a connection. And therefore, some of what I may say may repeat what's been said. I apologize for that, but I've appreciated all I have heard. Introduce myself extremely briefly and rather more humbly. All I ever say about myself is I am a nurse and a sociologist by intention, a baroness by astonishment. I was the first baroness I ever met, and uh, you were appointed to the House of Lords. That's how you get that strange title. And of course, it's a great privilege to be able to speak in the House of Lords. And I thought, how do I use this privilege? And the idea came, it's a wonderful place to be a voice for those people whose voices are not heard. So we do provide aid and advocacy for partners in places which are not reached by other aid organizations for political or security reasons. And they're the real heroes and heroines on the front. For developing that work, I established, as you kindly already mentioned, our small NGO HEART, Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. So I'm going very briefly to highlight just some of the key issues which are known to all of us, and I may be repeating them, but I think it's important to have them on the record and then offer some suggestions for constructive initiatives. As we all know, sadly, massacres, atrocities and abductions continue unabated in the vulnerable communities, especially across the northern and central regions of Nigeria. You will note in December 2020, Inter Society reported the killing of 34,400 civilians since 2009. Do we hear that on the news? No? British government calls it tit for tat. So there's a lot of work to do to get the truth out there and appropriate responses. And violence has escalated since then. The killings of people, both Christians and Muslims, continues to grow. And very new research by Christian Solidarity International reports that at least 615 people were killed by bandits, herdsmen, gunmen, and Fulani militants in the first three weeks of this year, in January of this year and approximately 13,050 Nigerians were displaced from their homes due to that violence. So it is escalating. According to the UN, almost 3 million civilians are internally displaced. And this brings me to my first primary plea, and that is there's an urgent need for humanitarian aid for all civilians suffering displacement. Hart receives almost daily reports of killings, rape, abductions, enslavement, land grabs, forced displacement in the Middle Belt, our local partner there, Reverend Canon Hassan John, told us that for over 10 years, displaced villagers have been forced to rely on aid from local churches or NGOs. He said, I quote, I can say categorically, there has been very little or no aid, not even from the state or federal government of Nigeria. And I'm not aware of any assistance from the British government in the central region, which is something I challenge with repeatedly. Another cause for concern is the growing number of kidnappings for ransom, which has continued to increase. Many villagers are forced to sell their properties and their animals to raise the money to pay the Fulani Islamists for the return of their abducted relatives. Moreover, many women have been repeatedly raped by their captors during their abduction. Thirdly, many Christians in Nigeria were deeply disappointed with the removal of the country 
from the USA's list of countries of particular concern, CPCs. With the listing of Nigeria as a CPC, the Nigerian government least knew that other countries were concerned about its response to the, we would call it, the slow motion genocide in many communities. Reverend John Joseph Hayeb, chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Kaduna State chapter claimed, I quote, the US's delisting of Nigeria from a list of violators of religious liberty is appalling as the persecution of Christians is still at its peak. Besides, the Nigerian government hardly engages Nigerians to deliberate the challenges of insecurity, possibly because their own hands are not clean. The awful part is not only that the Nigerian government fails to engage Nigerians to find a way out of the insecurity the country is faced with, but that the government is known for blaming victims of insecurity for, quote, not being careful enough, vindicating banditry and its perpetrators. End of quote from Reverend Hyde. But that's the context. And I'll just offer one or two recommendations for um, some kind of response suggested by our friends in Nigeria. First, they argue it would be extremely helpful to look critically at the radical ideologies that are currently festering in the region. There are radical imams and Islamic scholars who are giving their own interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith that need to be addressed. And the previous speaker has already mentioned the whole issue of Islamophobia. Those committed to trying to find a peaceful solution to horrific suffering, inflicted on thousands of people, suggest that it would be immensely valuable to find ways of engaging Islamic scholars who'd be willing and ready to address these radical teachings and issues, and to do that publicly, strongly, and honestly. Anyone not a Muslim imam would obviously be interpreted as attacking Islam, as being Islamophobic. So could the EU consider engaging and possibly empowering such Islamic scholars across the region? Secondly, it will be helpful also to have a platform where both Christian and Muslim clerics can meet and discuss common concerns in villages and town hall meetings. Not government sponsored or backed by political groups or politicians, but an initiative that is driven from community levels where Muslim and Christian clerics can be seen to be cordially interacting with one another. Reverend Canon Hassan John has tried this in some communities in Dross, and it is working, at least to a large degree. The mutual suspicion is not completely eroded, but they do meet, talk, and eat together. He emphasizes it's usually difficult, but it can be done. Thirdly, there's a need to address how Sharia law impacts minority non-Muslim groups in their communities. What are the legal instruments in place that protect minorities in northern Nigeria and the Sahel? How do Muslims or Islamic groups like Hizbah in northern Nigeria address complaints by non-Muslims? How do non-Muslims seek redress? Some of the major problems now, tragically, are the Christian girls who are abducted, converted, and married off to Muslims without their parents' knowledge and consent. Fourthly, there is still the challenge of moderate Muslims getting attacked by the more radical sects. And that's much worse, of course, for those who have converted from Islam. And fifthly, the need to address the Nigerian government's safeguarding policies for minority religions, if they exist, and if they're publicized, so that those affected can refer to them. Local Christian leaders claim that in some areas, the legal instruments do seek to address, we do seek to address, are available. But if they're under the control of people such as fundamental Islamists. This enables them to perpetuate the actions and the victims never get their justice. So in conclusion, I'll quote Reverend Hayab his own words. Every human has fundamental rights. The right of the Muslim and that of the Christian are the same rights. Until we start treating our citizens without recourse to religious sentiment, until we start treating our citizens with respect as citizens and not because they belong to a certain faith, our problem will not be solved. And I have to say, I'm afraid that the British government, because that was in the title that was given to me, uh, I have constant challenges to the UK government because they do not take seriously many of the issues which I try to outline this afternoon. So thank you for letting me share some of the pain and the passion with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Baroness, for all the work that you have been doing in uh, those troubled areas. And for those five points that you highlighted, I believe they are building blocks for strategies that we can use to continue to advance this conversation. And with us as a global community coming together, I believe we'll be able to tackle this issue. So thank you for your passion and your commitment to the region. Very, very much appreciated. Um, before we go to questions and uh, questions, I would ask uh, Ms. Tayaneda to please um, take the floor. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Baronel Cos, for availing yourself for this opportunity each time we call on you. And uh, Dr. Mazimo Introvine, uh, we, we met uh, uh, in, in two meetings, but one we spoke together and uh, you sounded uh, very laudable on what you do. And my friend, Dr. Alessandro Amicarelli, I think uh, this is opportunity, but what and Bob Destro has to drop out. We have our friends and also our partners, PSJ Nigeria, PSJ UK, who actually will be uh, sharing uh, a couple of uh, insight and what is on ground. That is going to be managed basically after question and answer and uh, Pastor Ayadi doing. But that said, everyone that is participating here, you can actually raise up your hand or send uh, if, uh, some questions. But the, I want to reiterate the urgency of uh, what is happening in Nigeria and the Sahel. And this is consequent upon uh, uh, this government that are negligent of atrocity that is going on daily. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, child enslavement, girls uh, enslavement, this is actually uh, a global cartel. It's a global cartel because uh, you see that over $25 billion industry and Nigeria and the Sahel region is contributing to, to that. So this is very, very important. And when you look at over 700 million people facing implosion, Europe will be overrun. So that is why now we are going to, we are going to work together uh, I believe uh, Dr. Introvayan and uh, Amicarelli and uh, Baron of course, we want to engage consistently so that there will be action from European Parliament and from different parliaments. And that is the reason why we are gathered here today. And I look at it consequently, we might be in Brussels very soon as we are going to be engaging. We are not going to stop because if we don't engage, nobody will engage. So it is very important and that is the reason Everybody should be thinking of how can we contribute to making sure international community take action because the atrocity is a global atrocity. But let me not lie to you, this is the world most neglected conflict read, uh, reading region. And we must take this and resolve it with our allies and friends. So up to you, uh, Sister Dimokiali uh, Akintelo. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I think all the, the, the wonderful speakers have really emphasized that this is a global issue that is going to take concerted effort. And um, this is hopeful that we are all here today. So this is the beginning of many more conversations and just grateful that you are all committed to this course and will continue to advance the conversation and even bring more like-minded people on board uh, to address this issue that doesn't only just affect Africa, but it's a global issue. And uh, so we continue to state that it is a global issue. It is a global issue and we can't keep looking away. So thank you all for your time. And now we're going to yield to um, our participants to ask questions, but please raise your hand if you have a question. We just, again, very concise question. Um, if you have any comments that you do, please put that in chat. This this, this forum now of this time is for questions and answers. So if you can direct your question to one of our wonderful speakers, that would be great. Keep the question very concise so that they can respond to you. Um, so please raise your hand if you have any questions or if you feel more comfortable, put the questions in the chat. We can also man that. Any questions? I do not see any hand. Okay. Um, okay, Benjamin Shen. Uh, 
Okay. Any questions? Um, I have a yes, question. Benjamin, Benjamin Shen is uh, raising his hand. I don't see his hand raised. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, um, Benjamin. Carl, can you unmute Benjamin? I don't see his hand uh, raised. Okay. Uh, see ahead. my hand here. Okay, uh -huh. okay, your hand is raised. On, no, it wasn't raised. Yes. On the man. Go ahead. Thank you. Please, I want to direct my question to the second to the last speaker, that woman that spoke. Uh, she spoke very well because she is really going into the field. She has entered into the field and she has known what is going on in the field. The issue that she raised between uh, of bringing the religious leader, the Imams and the Christian, like serious, like serious, it is going to be helpful. But what step have she really taken to meet these people? the northern part of Kaduna and uh, southern part of Kaduna state, because this issue is keep coming day in, day out. Please let me know. Thank you. Barrex. Barrex, are you clear, Matt? Uh, he's referring to the strategy you had highlighted about bringing two religious leaders together. And uh, he, he's, he's Question is more on the southern Kaduna, southern and Kaduna area. So, can you respond to that, please? Obviously, it's very challenging. But uh, um, our partner, who I've referred to, Reverend Ken San John, I mean, he's been doing this in Dross, and they're particularly concerned for the younger generation. And I've been involved in some of the reconciliation programs up there in Dross, and they want to bring young people together because they're so easily radicalized I and mean, they're vulnerable. Uh, they are in radicalized communities, many of them, um, and they're never given them an alternative view of how it's possible, perhaps, if they want to, uh, to live without being uh, terrorists. And also the women. And it's very important. They had some very good groups there where the Muslim women um, and the Christian women uh, work together. Again, for the Muslim women, they tend to be marginalized and um, oppressed and they not often have any opportunity for um, making any money or activities or initiatives, but they are approached uh, in a very tactful way by the other ladies and they work together and it transforms their lives. So it won't necessarily deal with the horrific scale of the problem, which we, when I gave some of the figures, um, but it may well build a place for a future if and when the horrendous um, terrorist uh, massacres uh, do give way to something or are, are contained or curtailed in some way. It may be building for the future, but it is helping a lot of people in the present, uh, especially women and young people. So it's not a, a fundamental solution to the scale of what's going on, but I think it's an important initiative that can make a difference to individuals. And it was something that was suggested to us by our friends in Nigeria. They would like to see much more of it happen. Thank you. Makes sense to our questioner. Yeah, that, that you do bring up very important point about engaging the youth. That is the demographic that is so critical to advancing peace because it's the youths they often use for to perpetuate this violence. So thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, someone has their hand raised. Manuel Gamalia. Okay. And we have, um, yes. So we'll go with Emmanuel first, Emmanuel Gamalia, and then Emmanuel Mock. Go ahead, um, Mr. Emmanuel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Um, <sighs> um, I am Gamal Emmanuel. I'm from the southern part of Kajuna. And these things that have been happening before now, you know, during our forefathers' time, we heard about jihad, how the Islamic people will come to conquer land and dominate the place. But in these days, what we hear the, um, from news agency, you hear of community clash or you hear of tribal clash. So my question is, is this not uh, a form of jihad that's happening? And a lot of people, most of the people in the communities, they look helpless. 
And so for me, is it not a form of jihad? If it is a jihad, let's know this is a jihad. And what should we do if it is jihad? Thank you for that question. So um, does who wants to take that? Who wants to respond to his question? Go ahead, sir. Dr. Yeah, the question of jihad uh, uh, is again uh, a question uh, uh, of uh, uh, politically correct terms and uh, how to uh, navigate uh, into delicate uh, question, uh, avoiding uh, Islamophobia, but at the same time uh, avoiding uh, naivete. Uh, of course, uh, uh, if we talk uh, to a scholar of Islam, uh, he would immediately uh, say to us uh, that there is the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. The greater jihad uh, is what in other religions is called self-cultivation, and this the fight uh, against uh, uh, our own uh, uh, bad uh, uh, inclinations uh, and uh, passions. So that's the great jihad. And then there is the lesser jihad, and that's the jihad uh, with weapons uh, uh, against the enemies uh, of, of Islam. And of course, we should acknowledge this point that uh, jihad for Muslim, jihad uh, means effort, and for Muslim, it's not a, a negative word uh, because uh, uh, every Muslim is engaged in jihad in the sense of self-cultivation. And some Muslims are engaged in jihad as militant or military uh, action on behalf of Islam. So we should acknowledge that there are these two meanings. But uh, uh, to avoid uh, uh, Islamophobia, but again, to avoid the naivete, uh, we should also acknowledge the existence of jihadism. And uh, jihadism is a movement uh, within uh, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, which believes that uh, many problems uh, Islam uh, confronts today can be solved through the lesser jihad or the armed jihad or the jihad fought with weapons. Now, here we have another problem. And the problem is that in traditional Islam, jihad should be declared by proper authorities. But today, uh, everybody uh, <coughs> uh, authority uh, in the world of political Islam, and we see people with uh, very modest or non-existing theological qualification uh, calling the Muslims to, to jihad. Uh, the leaders uh, of the, 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 the Islamic State uh, are uh, self-proclaimed uh, caliphs or leaders, but uh, it is unclear uh, how exactly they can presume to speak uh, in the name uh, of Islam. Uh, but that doesn't matter because uh, uh, who uh, proclaims jihad, uh, proclaims jihad the person who is followed. Uh, it's, uh, we may discuss uh, whether theologically or traditionally the person calling to jihad is qualified, perhaps he, much more rarely she, is not uh, followed. Uh, we have a jihad, uh, a less of jihad, and we have victims of jihad. So again, we should not shy away from the use of the word jihad. But we should qualify it and try to understand in which sense the Muslims in a certain area or some Muslims in a certain area using the word jihad, using the word jihad, and who has proclaimed this 
uh, jihad, uh, what justification the person who proclaimed the jihad has supplied, and so on. <coughs> Uh, the world, uh, uh, again, the words have consequences, and we should understand in which sense we are speaking of Japan. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, did Baron X Cox, please go ahead. You have something to add? So three very, very brief points. That the Islamist or the militant jihadists, as they call themselves, are quite explicit about it. And when they attack the villages and the communities, they will shout, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar and they claim that it is their jihad. Secondly, uh, it's very worrying because it's spreading. Uh, Burkina Faso, uh, the thousands have suffered from similar things of Burkina Faso, which tend to hurt hardly at all. And thirdly, um, one of the greatest uh, movements for militant jihad is ISIS. And of course, they're in Syria, we know what they did in Syria, but they're now firmly embedded in Nigeria as well. And so I think G militant jihad is something that is very serious and needs to be acknowledged and addressed appropriately. Thank you so much um, for that uh, contribution. So we have Emmanuel Mo. Go ahead, we've asked you to unmute. Emmanuel? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Good, in, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, I am speaking from Lagos, Nigeria. I, uh, I, Enada knows me quite well. One of the things I want to say, you see, a meeting like this is an important meeting because you have, you have people with tangible influence in the UK, in America, in Europe, in this meeting. If this meeting goes on and it's just us considering, like, uh, like, the, uh, like the anchor said, these conversations are things we'll be having regularly. The issue is on a daily basis, communities are being sacked. Last two weeks in Nigeria, somewhere in Niger, eight villages were sacked over a period of three days. The government, the security forces did nothing. Now, what I, sorry, I don't have a question to ask, just comments to make that I'm trying to make. And I'm appealing to this house. There are fundamental things that we can do. There was a meeting that had been called by ICON sometime last year. And one of the takeaway from that meeting was we should set up processes to track the money. If you notice, the fundamental belief I have is that the Nigerian government is enabling what is going on in Nigeria. Because last year, the National Assembly, in 2019, the National Assembly in Nigeria did an investigation of arms that are missing from the armory. And they came up with it that 179,000 assault weapons were missing from the police armory. Now, this is a fundamental figure. And the government did not take it up. That's one. The Nigerian government keeps borrowing billions of dollars internationally, but locally there are no projects to show for that money. But one thing we can see is Islamists across the whole of the Sahel region are, have grown in leaps and bounds. Even in Congo, in the uh, Southern Africa, like uh, Zambia and the rest of them. Some I appreciate your comments, sir. We, yes. Because of time, we're being mindful. We would like to keep it to questions totally understand your frustration and as a nigerian you have okay, every right okay, to let, let me, let me just say we do this. have forums to be able to have those so if you have a question to the guest we would ask you to do that now again because of the interest of time i i just want to be fair to all the participants this is a time for questions your comments are very much appreciated but can you wrap up with a question please if you have one if i have a question that question would be can we not identify certain fundamental things that to point out to the world to say, if you are not doing this, then obviously you are enabling this terrorism. Right. I'm just right. stop talking about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Engineer Mark. Thank you for your contribution. I think the reason for this meeting is to 
kickstart a process of engagement where such oh, no. issues will be raised uh, be, uh, 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 in the presence of uh, those who can influence NATO, who can influence uh, the ambassadors and also other allies. So I think uh, uh, that is uh, noted. So if there is no question, we just have uh, some uh, less than 10 minutes to go. So we would like, uh, before any other thing, at least uh, PSJ Nigeria, Ibeshi, and PSA UK, Pastor Lidori, to share six minutes, then we we'll thank our guests and panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So you are yielding you. to Emmanuel Ibesi. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I would really take your time. Let's have a very uh, short brief to make here. I believe that behind the so-called climate issues and uh, the Islamization thrust of this government in Nigeria is very clear. It's very clear that there is an ethnic religious program going on, basically facing Islamization of Nigeria. One, the question I have or the issues I have based on what we have had because of questions on whether we can engage Muslims and Christians to discuss these issues. We have the religious uh, free um, round table in Nigeria, which we have been engaging with uh, uh, Muslims, Christians, atheists, and all other faiths to see what their particular concerns are so that we can deal with them. We've had that ongoing, but the problems we have with engaging more actively is the more we try to move in the direction of creating activities that the world would take notice of, the wind got taken off our sail from here when Nigeria was delisted from amongst the countries of particular concern because we looked forward to being assisted from that area. That would engender a lot of engagement where a whole lot of activists are ready to track the funds being talked about by NGOs and how these funds are being deployed. But where you do not have the enabling environment from big brothers like the US or the EU, and then on one hand, you're coming to take away a delisting of a country like Nigeria from a country of particular concern, it became worrisome to us. Second, um, the issue of probably appointing a special envoy over the Sahel region would go a long way to dealing with harnessing the strategic um, program of the EU to so dealing with these issues in Nigeria in very specific orders. So I, I believe without taking much of your time, if we look at all of this, there are a lot of NGOs who know that if they get on the road to keep asking this question, Nigeria is a very, very radicalized country. Nigeria is full of extremists who are ready to come out after anybody that they, 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 they discern can be leading towards them. But we need that capacity from here. Like, you know, appointing a special envoy over the Sahel to coordinate this strategic moves we're talking about, we need to be able to do that effectively from here. And then we'll be able to take it up from there. I won't take much of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for that contribution. I appreciate you. Um, past, uh, Mr. Ineda, did you have another comment or should we yield to Mr. Adedoy? No, we we, we yield uh, we'll to uh, uh, Honore Beshi actually was former member of Nigeria House of uh, Representatives. And he is actually a board member of our uh, partner uh, partner organization, PSG. We need to uh, Pastor Adedoy, and after that, we conclude. Thank you, okay. Pastor Adedoy. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I really, a, a lot has been said. In fact, everything that needs to be said has been said, and I particularly want to thank everyone who's joined this conversation. The fact that you are here shows your love and care for Nigeria. However, as like Honorable Bishi uh, mentioned, 
just now. There is so much more uh, that can be done that can even enable um, the work that's going on here. A, a couple of key themes have come out of today's uh, conversation. One, that it's a global issue, not just that it's global in the sense that Nigeria and the Sahel are part of that global family. But the truth of the matter is that the things that happen in Nigeria and the Sahel has the potential to impact all of Europe and impact the globe at large. And so I heard the call for a concerted strategy to break the routine. And things have already been said, and there are things that have been said here and now. It's imperative that we all work together to sew together that co cohesive strategy. I did also hear, I think it was Bob Destro who said earlier on that um, whilst it is a global issue, the leadership has to be taken by Nigeria and Nigerians. And I think <coughs> the role of the diasporas in the various countries is important, but of course we must have that um, whole joining of hands together. I particularly want to thank um, our, our various speakers uh, for your contributions today. And of course, our host, uh, Jumoke, I give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir. I uh, appreciate that. And we've all talked about this. Uh, and I'm grateful that this is just the beginning of many more conversations in different regions across the world. It is, like you said, we have to build that coalition, coalition of Nigerians and friends of Nigerians for us to be able to address this very, very uh, serious issue in Nigeria and the Sahel. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate you. And I know we would be having very many more of this. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Ineda. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, uh, and my colleagues, uh, Kyle Abts and uh, AJ, Teye, and Ven, uh, for putting all of this thing together, even though we have some technical challenges, but we were able to overcome that. Uh, but I know Caroline Koss, thank you so much. I don't know, uh, you don't know how much we appreciate uh, your presence, your commitment, and your insightful uh, explanation from time to time. And uh, anytime we call upon you, you have been helping us in the UK, helping us in Nigeria, helping us even here in the United States. And uh, Dr. Mazimo Introvan, uh, I'm looking forward to discussing with you in a couple of hours. You and my friend, uh, uh, Alessandro, uh, would like to see how uh, we will set up this platform of engaging European Union to bring about this recommendation. It is important for an envoy is important for who are supplying arms. Where are these gears being sold to? What can be done? So this is what we want to do. We are going to be engaging the UK parliament, Italian parliament. We are going to be uh, engaging these individual parliamentarians and parliaments from time to time, but much more we'd like to begin to tell European Union that their silence uh, means a lot when they know about this thing, but they are silent. But I think I want to give it to them because we are not speaking. The era to speak and engage has come. That's the, uh, if there is any closing insight again from our panelists, you have the floor. If not, I would like to thank you all for making this. And I saw uh, uh, Julia, thank you so much. And I also uh, saw Jubilee campaign participating. All our friends, we thank you all. For everybody who has made it here, we thank you so, so much. So I give this uh, one, two minutes if our, any of our panelists has anything to say. And in the chat, uh, Julia also sent a, um, a link to a report on highlighting the arms issue in 2020. So please go ahead and download that. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just want to add two words to say thank you, everyone, for really starting this new chapter together. Uh, uh, that's uh, I totally agree with uh, when Baroness said it's not easy for her to be heard by the British government. It's not easy <laughs> for all of us to be heard. That's why we need to work together. We all appreciate what the Baroness does in Parliament. I saw her speaking many times, and her passion is really unique. So thank you very much for everything you are doing. 
we are all working uh, together for something good and hopefully we will get some tangible results at some point thank you very much thank you, you sir. Like thank you very much the privilege of being part of this very important meeting and to admire what you're all doing and i think the world ought to say thank you to you wonderful people in nigeria who are holding at great great cost your front lines of faith and freedom for the rest of the world so we owe you a debt of gratitude and it's a privilege to be with you uh, alongside you in your very very dark and challenging days so thank you thank you baroness anyone else thank you thank you Jumoke, for moderating so much so good thank you god bless thank you everyone have a good day and we look forward to seeing you at the next event which hopefully will be soon right mr Ineda? yes ma'am thank you all right have a good day everyone thank bye. you bye bye thank you thank you bye everyone.